Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Robert Grayboys. Robert is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center and formerly worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond and Chase Manhattan Bank. While Robert worked many years as a monetary economist and is here today to discuss some monetary history with us, he is currently working as a health economist here at the Mercatus Center. Bob is also a colleague of mine and a great hallway conversationalist. Bob, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here, Dave. Glad to have you on. We've had some fun hallway conversations. You know a lot. You speak many languages. You've gone from monetary economics to health economics, done a lot of interesting things. So you have a very interesting career path. So why don't you give us a kind of a brief overview of how you ended up where you are now? Sure. So I guess um, the genesis of it is uh, as in college, I was an English literature major who never took a drop of economics. Um, so what do you do with that? I don't know. You have a friend who's, in a, who's a newspaper editor who hires you to do some of that. So I was briefly a news writer. Uh, I was always frustrated because I knew zero economics and I knew I needed to, to do a good job of that. So anyway, after about a year of that, I decided I'm going to go take a couple of economics classes, get a master's in something. And I just immediately kind of fell head over heels for it. And within a year, I was at Columbia pursuing my doctorate in economics. I had taken a slew of courses. So I worked in, uh, so I studied at Columbia, eventually got my doctorate in New York. I worked for five years as sub-Saharan Africa economist for Chase Manhattan Bank, which had a sizable presence there. Turns out that the reason I was hired for that was because I had zero experience in sub-Saharan Africa and the guy who hired me was sick to death of everyone who did have experience. He wanted someone to think unconventionally. So he turned to me. So I worked there, and I loved it. It was a great thing. Um, Eventually, I got really tired of New York City. I'm from just south of Richmond, Virginia, and I just couldn't take the city any longer, especially after we had our son. So we moved back. So what are you going to do in Richmond? Uh, So I ended up working for the Fed. I worked there for 12 years. It had some high points. It had some interesting points. Uh, But it really was not... It it didn't sing to me, shall we say. So, I don't know, about midway through, my wife said, uh, I've noticed something about you. She said, uh, when we go on vacation, not once have I ever seen you take a book that had anything to do with the Fed or monetary policy. Why is that? I said, I don't know, because it's dull. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she said, but every time we go on vacation, you're reading about health care. Why is that? I said, because it's interesting. And she said, well, why don't you change? Why don't you be a health economist? I thought about it for a day or two and said, yeah, I'm going to take uh, take you up on that. So uh, I said, healthcare will be in utter turmoil for the rest of my working life. And given what I know about Social Security and Medicare, it's going to be a very long working life. So I did that. I ended up getting my doctorate. I went to teach at the University of Richmond for six years. And about six, 12 years ago, uh, there was a job with a trade association up here in D.C., right as the whole, it wasn't called Obamacare yet. Uh, no, I don't know. No one knew who Obama was at that time. Then, But it was that debate. I was brought up. I worked on that for six years. And six years ago, I came to Mercatus. So here I am. Very interesting. Now, you did some work on monetary economics before you made the transition, mm-hmm. including some articles I read on currency unions. So you are a hardcore monetary economist as well as a health economist. And moreover, you had a great graduate school experience you've told me about, and that is you worked for Don Patinkin, who was a very influential monetary economist. For those who don't know, he had a book called Money, Interest, and Prices, published in 1956. Very, very influential book for a long time, and you actually worked for Don Patinkin. You knew him, and uh, tell us about that, because you know I've never met him, obviously, and he's someone who's very influential in my profession, so what was it like? Oh, I knew him very well. So I was a grad student, and they were doling out uh, 
research assistantships. And department administrator a little bit sheepishly came to me and said, we've got this visiting professor. Uh, would you be willing to work for him, Don Patinkin? I said, oh, I'd love to work for Don Patinkin. Well, why wouldn't I? She said, well, he's he can kind of drive people crazy. He's very demanding, very nitpicky, very precise. And uh, I said, I don't care. I'd love to work for the guy. Well, anyway, I did, and I loved working for him. Uh, and the first day I went in there, he was he was working on a book, which I have sitting right here, called Anticipations of the General Theory, question uh, mark, in which he was trying to figure out what were the streams of thought that led to John Maynard Keynes. And his first assignment uh was he wanted to know whether Keynes's book, um, and the general I'll, theory, the general theory, okay, was there a comma after the second of the three words? So was the Oxford comma present in the first edition, first printing? So that's a very was, precise request. Very precise. So I headed off. This was long pre-internet, which meant that you had to crawl through all sorts of dingy, dark libraries all over Manhattan hunting for this. I finally found a first edition, and I brought it to him. I was just as happy as could be, and he looked at it, and he got sad and said, no, this is it's first edition, but it's not first printing. I need a first printing. I said, well, okay, I'll keep at it. And he said, you might not be able to find it because they're very rare. So I don't know. I went all over Manhattan and finally – stumbled on one in some library somewhere. I brought it to him and he just his eyes lit up and he said, Where did you find this? Well anyway, so he was very happy. So I said to him, Do you mind if I ask you something? I said, Keynes obviously didn't care too much about the comma because some of the printings had it and some of them didn't. He didn't he must not have cared very much. Why do you care so much? And he looked at me and he put his finger into the air and said, Because in Paris at the Cathedral of Notre Dame, hundreds of feet up in the air, there are these intricate carvings of gargoyles and all sorts of mythological beasts. And the centuries ago, when they were carved, the artists knew no one is ever going to see these things again. But they did their very best to make them things of beauty, uh, to make them intricate and, and beautiful. And he said, that's why I care about the, uh, the comma. He said, I want to be as careful as they were. Uh, and as you know, that, uh, that story became the basis for an article I wrote this week after the, the catastrophic fire at Notre Dame. And we will put it on the web page so our readers can take a look. But that, that speaks to precision and, and sticking with something and working through to the end. He was yeah. like that in general. Huh? Yeah, he was like that absolutely, totally in general. Um, uh, actually, I guess my proudest moment was when I realized that the type he had, his handwriting wasn't that easy to read, and some typesetter had replaced the word nor, I mean, not now, with the word not all through a chapter, and which would have been a disaster because it reversed right. the meaning of every single thing he was saying. Uh, but anyway, I, I also asked, um, you know, he had a long history, for many decades. He worked with all of the, all of the greats, all of that University of Chicago school. Uh, he was really one of the very early ones there. And he had this long history in theory and empiricism. And what, what is his legacy? I mean, for those who are younger, may not appreciate. Can you speak <laughs> to his legacy? I think he was kind of a, a bridge. Um, I don't know that people read his stuff at this point. I'm, you know, I've been away from monetary economics long enough. I don't know, but he was in some ways an interpreter and refiner of the things Keynes and and others were saying. In uh, he elucidated uh, slogging through Keynes is not an easy matter. Uh, Don Patinkin could be very clear. There's a view that while his book did not have ISLM diagrams in it, uh, that he more or less described ISLM 
that became later the basis for the diagrams. So a lot of the way mid-century monetary economics and macroeconomics was thought of was elucidated by, by Don Patinkin. Um, but anyway, by the time I met him, he was working on doctrinal history. So where did, you know, and economists hate doctrinal history. They don't even know it exists. Uh, as I said in my article, they think that The present state of economic theory existed at the time of the Big Bang and will be there till the sun (laughs) goes out. So I said, why, why, given your legacy, why are you doing doctrinal history? And he said, I'm doing it because no one else likes it. And he said, and when no one else is doing it, it's easy to be the very best in the field. So he spent a lot of years, his later years, looking at history of thought and, and how economics got to where it was. So knowing him was a great thing. Okay. Well, let's move from doctrinal history to monetary history. And I want to let our listeners know that Bob is something of a numismatist, which means in a fancy way you're a coin collector, a bill collector, and you know the history of many of the coins and bills you've collected. So we've had some hallway conversations, as I mentioned before, where Bob has explained to me some of the history behind these coins and bills, and very interesting ones, and there's lessons for us surrounding some of the histories of these coins. I thought it would be great for you to come on the show, Bob, and explain it to our listeners. And so we're going to work our way through history, Mm -hmm. and you've got these coins here in front of us, and we'll attempt to get pictures of these up online as well. And I want to go all the way back, starting with Diocletian, the emperor of Rome, Mm -hmm. um, almost 2,000 years ago, I believe 301 was the famous uh, Edict of Maximum Prices. Tell us the stories behind that and, and the coin that you have. Sure, and I'll just start by saying uh, I really got into this because I inherited a little box of coins from my grandfather who died long before I was born. He was an immigrant, and he had, I think I think some of them he must have collected on his way over to America. And okay. He lived in early Key West for a while, and which was a major seaport. And I imagine he uh, he had a store there. And I just imagine some of the sailors who came to town gave him these coins in trade. Uh, but anyway, so Diocletian, and this is actually a recent acquisition. I don't have a, a big collection, but I like to make it an interesting collection. Diocletian is is a remarkable story. Actually, I wrote a piece today that will mention him and this story. So he was emperor from, I think, 284 to 305, and has a remarkable fact that he was one of the few who abdicated and went home and relaxed after being emperor. Uh, I think he died in his own bed, which is extremely unusual for Roman emperors. A peaceful death, huh? Yes. Uh but anyway, the inflation had been roaring for a while and continued to roar. Basically, it was old story. They were debasing the currency. They were cutting down on the uh, the metallic value. The intrinsic value of the coins was dropping well below the face value. And just to be clear for our listeners, let's, let's go through that process. So the emperor or the government of Rome would collect the coins, melt them, take the precious metal out recast the coin and put some cheaper metal in? Is that how it worked? I guess, or they were stamping out new coins. Or stamping out and, new coins, and, okay. Uh, so I don't know if they were melting the old ones down, but it's an old story and has ruined many a country where they debase the currency. Um, but anyway, uh, as the coins got less and less valuable, of course, the prices of all the goods were rising and rising and rising because... You know, who wanted a cheap debased coin? You, uh, okay, I'll give you the merchandise. I will sell you this chicken. On the other hand, you're going to give me 10 of those debased coins rather than two of the good ones. Well, this bothered Diocletian to no end. He, he blamed greedy merchants, that it was greedy merchants that were doing this problem. And so he issued the edict of on maximum prices, which was a set of price controls on somewhere over a thousand goods. And it stands as probably the most remarkable story of the impotence of price controls uh, in that the penalty for violating the edict was death, death for both the merchant who was selling the goods and the customer who was buying them. 
Well, it appears that it had almost no effect. People just kept inflating and inflating and more or less ignored this. Every time they you know, sold a chicken for the wrong price, they were committing a capital offense and theoretically could be killed for it. And you know, the most one of the most powerful kings in the history of the world still couldn't stop it. Supply and demand conditions are a lot more powerful than even the strongest um, emperor or king. So it's uh, it's a nice precautionary tale, and every time some government decides to do wage price controls, this story gets dredged up. They don't learn from it, but but anyway, they uh, they ought to. So anyway, I have this nice little coin. I don't think anyone even knows what the name of this coin is or what denomination it was uh, because the empire was just pouring out these junk coins that no one really wanted. So we have a case of the quantity theory at work in the Roman Empire. Yep. And uh, a reminder that wage and price controls really don't work. Well, let's move forward in time to another coin you have. And you've got something from Henry the Seventh. Is yes. that right? And yes. what, what was the time range of this? So Henry the Seventh uh, was in the late fourteen hundreds, early fifteen hundreds. Um, he was heir to prior kings, but sort of tossed out the the ones that were were in there. He was the last king of England to uh, take office by battle, by okay. overthrowing and killing his predecessor, who Richard the Third, who by the way, showed up underneath a parking lot in England uh, in 2012. Um, no one knew what happened to him, and they they surprise, by, surprise, by God, they found was. him. Yeah. Well, tell us about his currency or his coin. Yep. So his, I think, I'd have to think about it, but I think it was his great 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 grandfather Edward the uh, Third created a hammered bronze currency. Uh, English kings found that when they debased the currency, they got weaker. When they kept the currency strong, they were stronger. And under a number of kings, they had kept quite tight quality control over uh, the precious metal content, the size, the weight, the shape. So what I have here is called a groat, uh, G-R-O-A-T, which is a, which is a four pence piece. And it's bronze and it's hammered, which means that someone would make a planchet. You would take molten bronze, pour it into a, a mold. And while it was still good and hot, you'd take it out with tongs. You'd put a die over it and you would slam it down with, uh, with a sledgehammer to make this. And, uh, I've only owned this for a few weeks, but it is my most beautiful, stunning coin. It's, uh, I'm, Stunned by just the, the, the beauty and the condition of it. Uh, anyway, Edward III was a, something like seven or eight kings before, uh, before Henry. And for the well over a century among those kings, this coin basically, they would change the picture of who was on it and the name, but basically the coin, the design did not change. It was very important. You know, you had uh, an illiterate population. They became accustomed to the looks of a coin, uh, the feel of it, uh, and it was very important to them. So this this coinage basically lasted virtually unchanged for well over a century. And uh, I think after Henry the Seventh, maybe after Henry the Eighth, it began to change. Uh, if you look at it here, it's got a very rough, crude edge. Uh, this was not precise. One of the really big technological changes in coinage that came later, uh, probably with the invention of the steam engine, uh, is the, the very precise, clean, circular, uh, planchets that we now have that, that our, our coins are stamped onto. So the problem with coins like this is, it was possible to scrape a little bit of the metal off the edge of it, and therefore you were the next time you were paying someone, it was with a little bit less metal, and these things would become debased over time. Now, this had enough inscription around it, and it made it sort of difficult to do that. I did run across a king of Denmark, Eric the Fifth, I believe, 
whose name a lot of these kings at that time had a uh, a name. So it'd be um, uh, you know William the Conqueror, Edward the Confessor. This Danish king was Eric Klippen, uh, and I was wondering what that meant. I looked it up, and it turns out. The pr- the procedure of snipping a little bit of silver or gold off the coin to cheat the, the person you're going to buy it is called coin clipping. And this particular king was thought to be a thief and a piece of trash. And the Danish people started calling him Clippen as uh, just to indicate that uh, you know, this guy is unscrupulous and will rob you blind. What a legacy. Now, coins we have today, just by contrast, they tend to have those ridges around the edge. Did that mm-hmm. emerge from that practice try, oh, as a way to check the mm-hmm. cl- clipping or shaving of the coins? Okay. Yeah. yeah, if you take a current coin, it would be awfully obvious if you clipped the edge of it off and tried to snip yeah. a bit of the metal out. Of course, the metal today probably isn't worth as much as these coins. Yeah, yeah the metal today isn't worth anything. Um, I mean, it's worth a couple of cents, right. no matter what coin you're... And we'll get into that because at this time, the intrinsic value of the metal in the coin was the key to its value. We are obviously in a very different period where it's fiat, fiat value. It is valuable because someone says it's valuable. And why that works is... Still, something of a mystery. Um, oh, well, I, well, I said I found a lot of the, the Fed stuff to be kind of dull. I really do kind of like the monetary the mystery history. of it's, money. Yeah, I still debated. All right. Well, let's move forward in time. Let's move up to the 1800s. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to move to something called a trade token that you have collected mm-hmm. around the 1830s, and tell us about these trade tokens. What are they, and how are they used? Yeah, the ones I have here, I think, are probably from a later era than that. They're probably okay. from the late 19th century, but the type. So in U.S. history, there have been several periods where coinage vanished for various reasons. Uh, one would be if you had silver coins that the silver in it, the melt value was, was high and the, and the, the, the face value was, um, Low, well, you would end up with situations where people said, "Is it, you know, I may as well melt the coin rather than spend it for its face value." Right. Uh, and so during these periods, when when the U.S. was going through cycles of inflation and deflation, uh, coins would vanish for a while. Some of them, a lot of them, would in fact be melted down. Sometimes they would just go away until conditions got better. But you ended up with situations such as in the, <clears throat> I think it was 1830s or 40s, where you had a tremendous shortage of of uh, small change. And you don't realize how difficult life becomes uh, until those things are gone. So there was some quote about, um, for, for want of a penny, the... Um, Someone would have would have to walk across town rather than riding in a in a coach, because the smallest thing you had would have been a one dollar paper currency, and in today's money, that's the equivalent of maybe twenty twenty five dollars. At a time where twenty or twenty five dollars was an enormous sum, I would have to think about what a a week's income would be. But you're really talking about you know, sort of in, in our life, if you imagine if the smallest money you had available was a $100 bill, how would you go about your daily life? You find it very difficult to buy a newspaper or a meal or a ride or anything else you wanted. Right. So stores began producing their own tokens. It would say good for trade, good for five cents at... Uh, this particular one, which again I think is later than this period, is from Cooper's store, wherever that is. I'll have to look it up online. Uh, but it would say good for five cents in trade at the store. And the thing is that people wouldn't just use it at the store. People would use it for everything. So it's okay, I don't have anything, any need to buy something from that store. So... But I'll take it anyway because somebody I run across will have. And you, you get to some point 
uh, at which it becomes a freely circulating medium. Uh, you can also, the, the expression, don't take any wooden nickels, that was part of this too. Some companies would make a wooden nickel that, you know, good for five cents at this cigar store. And as long as enough people in the population were using these things, you could circulate them uh, quite generally. And, and there were coins that circulated widely. Is that is that right? You mean these non coins? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they circulated quite widely. Um, some of the odder examples um, out west, there were a lot of these. You know, there were shortages of coins out there. It was just sort of sparse anyway out there. But uh, not to be indelicate, but a number of brothels would issue tokens good for trade there. And most of the population was not using the services of those brothels. Nevertheless, the tokens would circulate as money because, again, somebody in town will <laughs> want this thing. They would show up in church collection plates. Nice. And that was fine. And the closest I've had to that is, and I'm going to jump to this one. Yep. From the 1980s, a New York subway token. And in that time, I knew lots of people who didn't ever use the subway as their buses, but you could always, always give them a New York subway token in place of a dollar, uh, because somebody would want it and they knew that they would have absolutely no trouble getting rid of it. Um, after I left New York, I went to Richmond where there was a highway, a toll road that also had tokens. You could not possibly use those just because not enough people were interested in using that highway. So it, it for a non-money to become a virtual money, there have to be enough people out there using it that you don't have any trouble trying to get rid of the thing. So there must have been enough people using the brothel token. <laughs> in, yes, absolutely. And for it to get accepted at church, that must have been a sight, the uh, pastor picking up the offering plate, and there's a number of brothel tokens on the offering plate. Now, this speaks to one of the debates about money, what what drives money, right? So one of the stories is um, kind of a state theory or the charterless theory of money. It has the backing of government. Of course, the Diocletian story kind of <laughs> underscores or, or maybe is, is evidence against that. But th this also might be evidence against it. This, this would be a case where the network effect is more important, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of an emergent order story where um, – you get enough people using it, then you will use it. So the next coin I have is a really good example of that. This this was, again, during the Civil War, there was another of these massive disappearances of coins. Uh, and it was for two reasons. One was uh, Civil War finance meant there was a big inflation uh, so that you would have these coins, which intrinsically were very valuable because they all contained gold, silver, copper, uh, but also the wartime metal needs. Uh, the You needed metals to make cannonballs and bullets, and so there was a real scarcity. The, 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 the intrinsic value of metals was rising for the war needs. So all the coins just vanished. And the presumption was that the silver and gold ones probably had gone or had been melted down into ingot. So you needed small change. So some of these were trade tokens, but there appeared, and that's what I'm holding here, it's called a Civil War token. These look like the store tokens, trade tokens, but they promised you nothing. They simply said... Um, Things like Union Forever, uh, I can't read in the dark he here, but it, it has some patriotic slogan on it. Some of them said, not one cent. They look like, you know, American pennies, but, uh, but it said, uh, okay, this one says Union Forever. But some of them said, not one cent. Huh. But it circulated as a cent, and people would accept these, and they circulated as coins, even though there was no backing. No promise. They weren't legal tender. You couldn't pay your taxes with it. And yet they circulated as valuable pieces and people would accept them. Why is that? I think it's, it's a fascinating mystery. I don't know the, I don't know why they would take them other than there was some sort of a, 
implicit social contract that said we'll accept these and and you can you can use them because otherwise society will be a mess without any coinage well who was this, who were issuing the tokens during the civil war stores businesses yeah just i don't know folks, folks. Um, people would someone who had a um, you know, a metal business would stamp these things out okay. and circulate them. I I don't know how they got into circulation. I don't know if they sold them yeah. or if they just tossed them out there. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting story. I, I This is prompting me to figure out. Uh, right. There, there are specialists in the coin collecting world who are token collectors. Uh, they are a special breed among themselves. So either one or two things or both things happened. One, there was a... Enough of a network effect was developed. There's some threshold was crossed where mm-hmm. enough people were using these tokens that you would use it. And maybe some of the firms or institutions, people issuing this, maybe they had some backing. I can imagine like a large store or firm may have helped get it going at first. So instead of having government back and you got mm-hmm. some entity backing it, but uh, a mix of backing and network effects must have propelled these tokens forward. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, let's go from the tokens of the Civil War, and let's move to something else that's interesting that you've shared with me previously, and this is the postage stamps. They were also a form of coin or a quasi-coin. Is that right? Yes. So U.S. law prohibited the government from issuing paper currency smaller than $1. So when coin shortages appeared, um, people would get very... Creative. They would issue those store tokens. They would issue the Civil War tokens later. Um, Before the Civil War, there was a bout of this, and people needed small change. So what they started doing was taking postage stamps and encasing them in some transparent, I assume it must have been mica, and you would have these, it looked like a coin, with a window, and inside of it was a postage stamp. So, you know, I guess in theory you could always pull the stamp out and stick it on a letter, but whatever it was, it was um, these things circulated for a while. Some stores put them out. Um, I'm trying to remember one. Maybe it's Macy's. may have been one of them. Oh, interesting. Uh, Some well-known department store was issuing some of these. Uh, because they, they had to keep their commerce going, and if no one had any small change, um, they were going to lose a lot of business. So the stores themselves helped produce this. At some point, and I forget the exact year when this happened, you know, the federal government needed to produce small change, but they couldn't, uh, again, because the metallic value was higher than the than the face value, so no one, everyone would melt them. But they needed change. Now they couldn't produce a currency note smaller than one dollar. So what they did was they took these pieces of note paper and they would, for instance, print on it five ten cent stamps. Now. They were sort of overlapping. You couldn't actually cut them out and use them as stamps because they were overlapping. But the government said, wink, wink, nod, nod. This is actually five stamps. It's not a piece of currency. And people said, okay, well, I'll take the five stamps and I'll circulate them around. And uh, <clears throat> and this was a workaround to what laws to make coins? Um I mean, Whatever currency acts gov- governed okay. uh, govern the production of currency, they did not allow the the government or anyone else, I believe, to uh, to produce fractional notes explicitly at that point. So this is a workaround to the rule that said you, you can't, can't make anything less than a dollar right. on paper. Right, and okay. so they would say this is not a piece of currency. This is a postage stamp, or this is five postage stamps. This seems so blatant. No one ever said anything or everyone realized there was a well, need. Let's just kind of wink, wink and move on. Well, I can't remember if this was under his tenure, uh, but Salmon P. Chase uh, was involved in some of these things. And Salmon P. Chase, he, wa- he uh, as Treasury Secretary, pushed through Legal Tender Act. Right, the Greenbacks. Right, right. 
You know, then Lincoln appointed him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and maybe three years later, uh, I think he was the primary author of a ruling that said that practice is unconstitutional. So, Which is a bit of a puzzle. Yes. So he had both created the thing and then a couple years later declared, I had no right to do that. No one can do that. Um, Interesting twist. Yep. Now, but was he part of the, um, the the currency stamp notes that the government issued? Was he part of that story too? I think he was. I'd have, okay. to, I'd have to look at my book. Well, that would be consistent that. with his uh, creativity in, in issuing money. So the greenbacks, which is well known for the Civil War mm-hmm. financing, mm-hmm. as well as these currency stamps, which were technically stamps but effectively currency. Yep. So, yeah, you have a problem, and humans find a way around that problem, even if mm-hmm. there are legal obstacles to doing so. Mm-hmm. Well, let's look around that time as well at another form of coin or money. That's a 20 cent piece. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. There have been lots of experiments in American currency history. So for a while we had a um, half cent piece uh, back in the 1700s and early 1800s. Eventually that became judged too small to be necessary uh, there are some people for, for years, there have been people pushing to abolish the, the penny in American commerce. Um, and there's some odd stories on that. When we get to discuss Alaska, remind me to tell you about the sort of mythology of, uh, small coins. But, uh, we had two cent pieces. We had several types of three cent pieces. We had two different kinds of five cent pieces. We had the nickel, which we have now. There was also a teeny tiny thing called a half dime, which was, you know, half the size of a dime and very unpopular because it was really easy to lose them. Okay. Um, and so the physical properties could determine what is a useful coin or not. So this 20 cent piece that I recently acquired from 1875. You'll notice it's a little bit smaller than a quarter. It's a little bit, I don't know, It's a, it kind of looks nickel size. And it got to be very unpopular because it looks too much like other coins and people would you know, use the wrong coin in making change and realize either that they kind of got stuck they, they they spent too much or they or they received too little in, in exchange. So the twenty cent piece vanished very quickly. Uh no one wanted it. It's kind of like in recent years uh in the nineteen seventies they introduced the Susan B. Anthony dollar, yep. which was a small dollar that was just slightly larger than a quarter, and it was a colossal flop. I think I have some of those sitting at home. <laughs> no one in American history since 1792, no matter how they've designed a dollar coin, no one with one big exception uh, has ever wanted to use them. <clears throat> they, um, you know, Britain, they use the one pound coin, but to do that, and Canada did the same, they had to get rid of the, uh, the one dollar, the one pound note. Not until you get rid of the note do people say, okay, I guess I'll have to use the coin. And we've never managed to get rid of the $1 note. So the $1 coin has never been popular. I have in my files uh, a document that only some bureaucrat could have written. It was the U.S. Treasury talking points for the Susan B. Anthony dollar. And it had said, convenient to use as it weighs almost exactly one-third as much as four quarters, which uh, is just a, a sentence that could only have been written in Washington, <laughs> D.C. comparison, right? Yes. And uh, it also said, easy to hear when dropped. Uh, so anyway, we tried. They've, they've put a sort of goldish coloring on the... Sakajawea, um, Sakajawea. Yeah, I still I see know. some occasionally around. Like the occasionally. ones my, I've gotten from home. I know, like, for example, I've gotten change back from a vending machine. One time I had to put a big dollar bill, like a five dollar bill in, and I got a bunch of those coins back. I didn't want them, but they were given to me. Yeah, I remember when I was at Chase in the 80s, I had a roll of dateless Buffalo nickels. They were too worn to see the date, which means they're virtually 
they're worth basically a nickel. So I had them, and I thought I'll have some fun. I'll use them in vending machine. And one of my colleagues came running in all excited and said, You're, you'll never guess what I just got out of the vending machine. I said, a buffalo nickel? He said, how did you know? I said, because I just put it in there. <laughs> <laughs> kind of took the air out of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. But there was one group in American history, one or two groups, but really one predominantly that used, and I'm now holding um, uh, an 1880 Morgan design silver dollar. And it was used quite heavily by African Americans. Interesting. Um, this is in a period where most of them were freed slaves or children of freed slaves, and lots uh, were illiterate or semi literate. They had been, you know, it had been illegal to teach them to read when they were slaves. So there was a struggle. At the time, you had currencies were put out by banks, they were put out by the government, there were all sorts of currencies. And it was very easy to be taken in by a counterfeit because um, you had to really know precisely what the thing said and who put them out. But a silver dollar, you know, there was one design there. And uh, as long as you had this, you knew, yes, yeah, so the federal government put it out. The other thing is that the recently freed slaves had seen the Confederates' wealth go up in smoke when the Confederate currency collapsed. And so there was just this natural, we don't trust paper currency uh, because it's easy to counterfeit and because we've seen how quickly it can vanish. So it became something of a tradition in the African-American community to, like at the birth of a child, to give a silver dollar as a present. And in fact, the one I'm holding uh, came from an African-American gentleman who did some work uh, with my father back in the 1960s, and he knew I was interested in coins, and uh, he would bring me these silver dollars, and I, I retained this one from uh, from his kindness, and I, I never knew Very the, interesting. I, yeah, I never knew these stories back then, but I'm presuming that was part of why he uh, you know, why he gave it to me. Okay, about the same time as that sil silver dollar you were just talking about, there were also trade dollars issued, which is a very fascinating story I hadn't heard about until you mentioned it. So please tell our listeners about it. Yeah, it was actually something of a miserable failure of a U.S. coin, but it was it was created in the 1870s by an act of Congress and was discontinued a few years later and actually was the only coin in U.S. history that was demonetized. It ceased for a while to be legal tender. I think they, I think they reversed that later on. But this was a, a dollar coin that was designed only to be used outside of the United States. Outside, huh? Yes. Uh, they did not want them circulating in the U.S., they, in fact, the primary market was in China. Uh, China was opening up. There was a huge amount of trade going on. A lot of it was opium trade. I look at this trade dollar I'm holding, and I, I wonder what was purchased with it, but I'm guessing some drugs. <clears throat> huh? somewhere, somewhere in its, its life, uh, it bought some opium. Uh, the reason for it was, um, Chinese merchants did not like our silver dollar. It's slightly smaller than the trade dollar. It weighs slightly less. The silver content was slightly less. And they were used to dealing with coins like the, um, the Mexican, Mexican reales, um, which, which were roughly the same size and they were slightly larger than a US dollar and the Chinese merchants were happy with the size of it. Uh, they used a couple of other silver coins of uh, roughly the same weight, same denomination, same size. They didn't like our dollar because it was too small. And also we had changed designs a few times 
and the Chinese merchants, probably for the same reason that African Americans distrusted all of these conflicting paper currencies, they did not like changes in designs. So Mexico made a big error uh, when they had the uh, the Emperor Maximilian, who uh, was the unfortunate ruler of Mexico. He was the uh, they decided uh, Mexico needed an, to be an empire, and they needed to bring European royalty in to rule it. And Maximilian became the emperor. He was the brother of the uh, the emperor of Austria-Hungary. And uh, he, I gather, was sort of a well-meaning guy, but he didn't work out well, and they shot him. <laughs> uh, he was lined up and executed uh, in 1867, I think. But during his tenure, he decided he was royalty. He needed to have his picture on the coins. So they put him on the reales, at which point the Chinese merchants just stopped taking them because the design changed and they were unaccustomed to the new design. And it created something of an opening for other coins to take the place. So Congress decided that they needed to create a special trade dollar, and it says on here, trade dollar, um, uh, something that would appeal to the Chinese merchants. Uh, it would never change in its design. Senator John Sherman of Ohio, uh, brother of William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, put, uh, and again, in this light, it's hard for me to read the exact, but it has an inscription telling exactly how many grains it weighed and how fine the silver content was. And it was thought that's actually kind of a funny thing to add because basically very few Chinese merchants would have any idea what it said or what it meant. But he insisted on it being on there, so it's on there. Um, I will have to admit, I've never... I and, and in preparation for talking here, I tried to do some educating myself. I've never quite understood some of the weirdness of this coin. So it is slightly larger and has slightly more silver than a standard U.S. dollar did. But some of them made their way back into the U.S., which the Treasury hated the idea of. They didn't want them here. And for some reason, they circulated at a discount, even though the silver content was higher. Um, as an economist, I have absolutely that, no yeah, idea. What the, I have no idea what the logic of it was, but it was unpopular. And maybe it was larger, and more cumbersome to carry around. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I I have read many descriptions. None of them make any sense to me. Well, let me ask this about the Chinese. So they preferred silver, right? That mm -hmm. was. And later they were on the silver standard. Mm -hmm. I mean, Milton Friedman talks about how they did not experience the Great Depression because they were on a silver standard when the rest of the West was on this gold standard, which, you know, caused much pain. So that's part of the story here is they liked silver in China. Yeah. Um, I, I may be confusing stories, but I believe the emperor during this time who, who gave this very florid endorsement of, uh, of this coin and, said merchants must not distrust it they and they must accept them and revere them. it was a, it's very florid praise of the trade dollar i think he had been the emperor who introduced the bimetallic standard there so that uh so that silver became a very important part of the chinese trade so yes they they liked it very much uh there's a it Greek? was accepted and widely used in China. Yes. Yes. Okay. In fact, there are none on this one, but there are many, many of these have what are called chop marks. C H O P. And what this is, is that Chinese merchants would have a little tiny metallic metal die with a Chinese character on it, uh, representing the name of their business. And they would, take a trade dollar, and they would stamp these Chinese characters on them. So some of them are sort of defaced by having Chinese writing, just a lone character, and maybe several different ones from several different merchants. Um, I don't know if they were advertising or sort of marks of authentic authenticity. I weighed this, and it works. 
Uh, they used to be disliked by collectors. I think at this point, collectors actually kind of like the chop marks because it's just such an odd piece of history. Yeah. Well, let me ask one more question on this, and we'll go to the final coin related to Alaska. But on this coin, you mentioned the emperor really plugged for it, really made a, a pitch. Was his promoting the coin a pivotal, uh, you know, driver behind it being accepted, or was it being accepted already? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I was the, just wondering yeah. for the case of like, did, did, did the government, you know, backing it make it acceptable or was it kind of, again, this, this, the story between government backing versus kind of network effects driving its use? Yeah. I mean, one of the, <clears throat> apparently one of the aspects of this was that the treasury really didn't want these things circulating. They weren't the same weight. They weren't the same size. Yep. Um, you could end up with some sort of a Gresham's law situation where it might the high silver content might drive out regular dollars. And some of them started making their way back into the U.S. I think the Treasury really wanted these things to go to China. You'd buy your goods, your rice, your opium, whatever, and that they hoped the guy on the other end would just then melt it down. And I so see. these things would sort of vanish. Um, but, but it had a somewhat troubled history, which I wish I understood better, but I've never found an explanation that makes any sense to me. Okay, well, let's move on. And Tom, we have left to the Alaska Bengals. Tell us about that. And you mentioned earlier the mythology of small coins. Yep. So, and I don't own any of these. I need to get them there. There are a lot of fake ones for sale out there. <clears throat> so I have to find a reliable token dealer. But in 1935, the federal government created these, well, they, they created an agency, the ARRC, the Alaska Rural Rehabilitation um, Bureau or Board, I forget, I think it was Bureau. And the purpose of it was to sort of airlift people out of the Dust Bowl of the Midwest, uh, the Oklahoma Dust Bowl and whatever, and move them to Alaska and set them up as farmers up there. So this was just one more of the Alphabet Soup New Deal programs. It still exists. I think it's I think it's the original. Really? So if um, I wanted to move to Alaska, there's some government program to subsidize my move? I think it is a kind of a – I think it's a loan agency, one of those okay. farm loan agencies. Um, I didn't realize. I just looked it up and, oh, they They're still have still a there. website. <laughs> um so they also set up commissaries around Alaska so okay. where you could buy, I'm sure you, you needed to buy tools, you needed to buy plows, you needed to buy seed and those sorts of things. And for whatever reason, the federal government decided they needed to have their own currency. And they made these little aluminum coins, which I'm not sure anyone knows why, became known as bingles. Uh, they are really plain and unadorned, uh, stamped on aluminum. And they circulated there. They had various denominations, and this became, again, even, it was actually the federal government made it legal tender in Alaska. So you could, you were guaranteed of being able to spend these things. Um, anyway, they eventually fell out of circulation, and they disappeared, and, and so they're now just, just for collectors. I don't know when they demonetize those. They weren't, were not official U.S. currency. I said they demonet, trade dollar was the only demonetized, but I think these things ultimately were uh, no longer legal tender, but I don't think they ever had been outside of the territory of Alaska. But let's say the Alaska settlers were in some ways a peculiar lot. Um, People who went up there, they took a special type of person. It's a hard life. That's it's a hard sure. life, especially back then. And um, well, that's interesting. From the Dust Bowl of Oklahoma to the frontier life of Alaska, one hard life to another hard life. Mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. and a great uh, story. A lot of others went. Uh, there were others who went from Minnesota. The the reason Sarah Palin sounded like Sarah Palin uh, is because. That whole valley was settled by people from Minnesota who, oh, that is um, a good point. yeah, the, um, so it's the same accent basically right. that you'll find in right. Minnesota. Um, but anyway, the, uh, 
Another odd aspect of coinage in Alaska at that time, there were loads of saloons, and the saloon keepers did not like any coins smaller than, I think it was smaller than a quarter. Maybe it was a dime, but I'll say a quarter because I think that's what it was. And if you bought yourself a beer and you plunked a couple of dimes on the on the bar as a tip, the bartender would take his hand, sweep it off onto the floor. And the reason was because they had this perception that small change pushes wages down. That if you only have bigger coins, wages will have to stay huh. higher as a result. I think because you can't, you won't be able to, uh, you know, cut the wages by less than a, a quarter. And so they, they basically would not accept small change. And, uh, they got really irritated when, uh, when people would, would use it. Uh, I have heard, I mean, that was actually in recent years, there have been people who've advocated getting rid of the penny. And one of the arguments that, which I think is entirely erroneous, is if you do that, you know, wages will rise because you won't be able to pay someone, you know, nine dollars and thirty three cents an hour. You'll have to pay them nine thirty five, uh, and somehow, you know, it, it also works in the other direction. But that right. doesn't seem to. But anyway, people have these mythologies, superstitions about what denominations work. Very interesting. Well, with that, our time is up. Again, we'll have pictures of these coins on the webpage, or links to them at least. Our guest today has been Bob Grayboys. Bob, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.